Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm Darren McBreen. It is Thursday, April 28th, 2016. Here's a quick look what's coming up. Tonight, as the 28 pages gain mainstream acceptance, more and more Americans want to see them. I was wondering, would you be in favor of seeing the 28 pages that have been redacted from the 9-11 Commission report? Would yeah, you sure. be one to see those released? Yeah, I'd like to see them. You got them? Meanwhile, Saudi Arabia threatens financial sanctions against the U.S. if prying eyes continue to investigate 9-11. That's next. And we begin this evening with a warning to the United States from the government of Saudi Arabia. Release the 28 pages and you will face an economic collapse. That's right, the Saudis are threatening the United States with financial terrorism. And they have warned the Obama White House that they are ready to sell off $750 billion worth of U.S. Treasury bonds, which could seriously cripple or even destroy the U.S. economy. But why on earth would Saudi Arabia threaten the United States? I mean, they're supposed to be our ally, right? Well, it's because Saudi officials and members of the Saudi royal family are panicking right now over a federal lawsuit, which may finally reveal the contents of the still classified 28 pages of the Joint Inquiry Intelligence Report on 9-11, which will prove once and for all that the government of Saudi Arabia helped finance and assist the terrorist hijackers responsible for the attacks on 9-11. And this is where I say it looks like the conspiracy theorists were right all along. Don't say we didn't tell you so. And who was it that made the decision to classify the 28 pages to begin with? Well, you guessed it, George W. Bush. Let us never tolerate outrageous conspiracy theories concerning the attacks of September the 11th. Malicious lies that attempt to shift the blame away from the terrorists themselves, away from the guilty. And don't forget, Bush and Cheney, they never even wanted a investigation into 9-11 to begin with. It was only until after the victims' families and the 9-11 survivors, it was, it was after they demanded an investigation that the 9-11 Commission was created. And get this, Bush and Cheney refused to testify under oath. Instead, they agreed to meet with the 9-11 Commission only behind closed doors and under the following conditions. They would meet together. The session would not be recorded nor would it be transcribed or made public. Very suspicious, don't you think? And even more bizarre, I think, was the, just Bush's mannerisms and his body language. This was during the press conference right after he and Dick Cheney met with the 9-11 Commission. Mr. President, as you know, a lot of critics suggested that you wanted to appear jointly with the vice president so that you two could keep your story straight or something. Yeah. Can you tell us what you think of the value of appearing together and how you would answer those critics? Yeah, first of all, look, I mean, if we had something to hide, we wouldn't have met with them in the first place. We answered all their questions. And uh, as I say, I think I, I came away good about the session uh, because I wanted them to know, you know, how I said strategy, how we run the White House, how we deal with threats. Uh, the vice president answered a lot of their questions. I answered all their questions. And I think it was important for them to see our body language as well, how we work together. Uh, uh, but it was, uh, you know, the commissioners will speak for themselves over time. They'll, they will let you know whether they thought it was a fruitful series of discussions. I, th I think they did. I think they, I, think they, I think they found it to be useful. Yeah, Adam. Mr. President, did, did the, yes. did the, don't you think that the families deserve to have a transcript or to be able to see what you Adam, said? Adam, you asked me that question yesterday. I got the same answer, yeah. You see, right there, you could tell he's nervous, and it looks like he's hiding something. And I think you can even get more of a sense of his awkwardness if you watch the press conference in its entirety. It's only five minutes long. I mean, Bush was in and out of there in a big hurry. He looks very uncomfortable. You could tell he doesn't want to be there. I mean, he is squirming the entire time. And that's because they were hiding something. And guess what? They still are. 
So what are they so afraid of? I mean, why does Bush and the Saudi royal family, why do they want to keep the 28 pages secret? And why is President Barack Obama acting like such a coward when it comes to getting threats from Saudi Arabia? What on earth is in those 28 pages? Here's what we know so far. According to members of Congress from both parties who have read it, as well as the heads of the 9-11 Commission, they say the 28 pages will completely change everything you think you know about the 9-11 attacks. These documents will change history. This sort of shocking when you read it, as I read it, and we all had our own experience, I had to stop every couple pages and just sort of absorb and try to rearrange my understanding of history for the past uh, 13 years and the years leading up to that, it, it challenges you to rethink everything. And so uh, I think the whole country needs to go through that. I want those documents declassified. I'm embarrassed to be associated with a work product that is secret. Former Senator Bob Graham said that the 28 pages primarily relate to who financed 9-11. Follow the money, right? And they point a very strong finger at Saudi Arabia as being the principal financier. And I'll never forget watching Senator Max Cleland on CNN with Wolf Blitzer when he announced that he was going to resign from the 9-11 Commission because the entire investigation was a scam are legitimate members of the commission. We have the top security clearances. We're an independent commission for an independent operational look at why 9-11 happened, what happened there, when the pre what the president and the government knew, and when they knew it. What's their, what's their argument, the, the White House? Why won't they let you see this? What do they say? They, they don't want any more eyeballs to see their documents than they can possibly get away with. It's a scam. It's absolutely disgusting. Now here's where it gets even more interesting because not only does the 28 pages reveal Saudi Arabian involvement in the September 11th attacks, but it also specifies sources. We're talking names, all right? We're talking specific individuals that are implicated here. And one of the names on the list is extremely significant. We're talking bombshell. In fact, drum roll please, ladies and gentlemen, I give you Prince Bandar bin Sultan, who was the Saudi Arabia's ambassador to the United States at the time of the terrorist attacks on 9-11. And he also just happens to be a lifelong intimate and personal friend of the Bush family. In fact, he is so close with the Bushes that his nickname around the White House is Bandar Bush. Look it up. It's an open secret. Not only is Prince Bandar a longtime business partner of the Bushes, but they also have a very close friendship together. And this, of course, includes Bush Sr., who would bring Prince Bandar along on hunting trips. They would go fishing together, hang out with the family, go on vacations. A very cozy relationship. And this is troubling because that means two sitting U.S. presidents had close personal and financial ties with a foreign power. Get it? I mean, this was an unholy alliance. Well, it still is. And in one of the redacted sections of the 28 pages, there is evidence of a transfer of $130,000 from Prince Bandar's wife that went directly into the checking account of the 9-11 hijackers. Wow. Wow. And there was also other members of the Saudi royal family, all of these guys who have close ties with the Bush cartel, by the way. And according to the 28 pages, they provided financial assistance to several of the 9-11 hijackers, and then they fled the country days before the attacks. Now, I want you to picture this because what I'm about to tell you actually happened. It is documented, and it is in the White House logs. This occurred just a couple days at, after September 11th, September 13th to be exact, but President George W. Bush and Prince Bandar, they were actually hanging out together during a private meeting, smoking Cohiba cigars on the Truman balcony 
at the White House. Well, I tell you what, I sure would have liked to have been a fly on the wall during that conversation. But I have a pretty good idea what they were talking about. I imagine they were discussing the evacuation plan and how they work together to evacuate and to smuggle out of the country members of the Saudi royal family, Saudi officials, and even members of the bin Laden family out of the country immediately after the 9-11 attacks. And keep in mind, this was during the time when all air travel in the continental United States was grounded. Nobody was allowed to fly. Yet the order was given straight from the White House to evacuate Saudi Arabians and even members of the bin Laden family, one of them who was actually on the terror watch list at the time. Incredible. And they were flown out of the United States, dozens of them from multiple cities all across the country, back to Saudi Arabia. And instead of interrogating these guys and asking them questions, well, the FBI provided security. And they smuggled these suspects out of the country. You know, and the bin Laden family was whisked out of the United States by President Bush himself right after the 9-11 attack, and they went back to Saudi Arabia, correct? That's right. You see there, even Bill O'Reilly is finally talking about it now. Better late than never, I guess. And, you know, what really gets me, it, it makes me angry. It bothered me back then, and it really bothers me now in hindsight, and that is the rhetoric the warmongering, the hypocrite George W. Bush at the time, who was well aware of the fact that the 9-11 terrorist attacks were not only largely funded by the government of Saudi Arabia, but also in part by his very close and personal friend, Bandar Bush. I mean, what the f Every nation in every region now has a decision to make. Either you are with us, or you are with the terrorists. And that, my friends, was the worst president in U.S. history. Well, until now. Barack Hussein Obama has promised on at least two separate occasions that he would release the 28 pages. Yeah, we're still waiting. You know, he actually met with the 9-11 victims, family members, and the survivors, met them face-to-face, -face, looked them in the eyes, and promised them that he would release the 28 pages. Now we're finding out that he's never even bothered to read the documents. The 28 pages of the 9-11 report. Have you read it? Uh, you know, I have a sense of what's in there. Jim Clapper, uh, our director of uh, national intelligence, uh, has been going through to make sure that uh, whatever it is that is released is not going to compromise some uh, major uh, national security interest of the United States. And what was Obama's reaction to the threats made by Saudi Arabia to destroy our economy? Well, he boarded Air Force One on a direct flight to Riyadh to go bow down to the Saudi king. King Salman, who, by the way, is also mentioned by name reportedly in the 28 pages as yet another financier of the attacks on our country. Yeah, that looks like an accurate depiction right there. Obama says he will veto the bill in Congress that would release the 28 pages to the public and allow the 9-11 victims' families and survivors of the attack to sue the Saudi government. Not going to happen. We don't know what's in those pages, except that we do know it pertains to the Saudi government and two American presidents don't want it released. Add to this the following. Last year, President Obama signed an agreement with Saudi Arabia to provide for the sale of 60 billion, with a B, dollars worth of weaponry over the next 10 years from American arms merchants to the Saudi government. Donald Trump, on the other hand, says if he becomes president, he will indeed release the 28 pages. And that's why we need an anti-establishment president. And for those of you out there who say that it's not good enough, there's more to 9-11 than just the 28 pages. Well, I'd have to agree with you. You're absolutely right. But get this. Once these documents are released to the public, that's when the entire house of cards begins to fall.
It was almost as if it were a planned implosion. It just pancakes. Well, pancaking almost like a precision implosion. It's reminiscent of those pictures we've all seen too much on television before when a building was deliberately destroyed, destroyed by well-placed dynamite to knock it down. There's no doubt that our country is in serious trouble right now. And if you're wondering how on earth we ever got in this situation, well, I'll tell you how. When the Democrats showed their true colors, you got angry and you elected Republicans. And then when the Republicans showed their true colors, you got angry and elected Democrats. And when anyone suggested to you that both parties were corrupt, and that neither side were looking out for your best interest, you acted like they were crazy. But the real definition of crazy is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. That's why it is vitally important that you wake up America and break the matrix. Infowars.com, PrisonPlanet.tv, and The Alex Jones Show, because there's a war on for your mind. Uh, the vice president and I just finished a a, um, a good conversation with the 911 commission. It was wide ranging. It was uh, important. Uh, it was uh, it, it, it was just a good discussion, and I really I appreciate the members. Um, I, I want to thank the chairman and vice chairman for bringing the commission here and uh, giving us a chance to share views on, a, on, 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 on different subjects. And uh, they had a lot of good questions. And uh, it was, I'm glad I did it. I'm glad I took the time. It was, this is an important commission. And it's important that, uh, that they ask the questions they ask so that they can help uh, make recommendations necessary to better protect our homeland. And, uh, but it was a, uh, I enjoyed it. Let me ask, answer a couple of questions. President, what topic did the commissioners want to spend most of the time on? And were there any subjects that you didn't answer or were advised by your counsel not no. to answer? I was never advised by my, my, my counsel not to answer anything. I answered every question they asked. Uh, I, I really, I, probably best that I not go into the details of the conversation and let them incorporate into their report. Uh, there was a lot of interest <clears throat> Excuse me. A lot of interest in about uh, about how to better protect America. In other words, they're they're very interested in the recommendations that they're going to lay out, and I'm interested in those as well. And uh, we discussed a lot of things, Terry, a lot of subjects, uh, and uh, you know, it, it was a very cordial conversation. I was I was impressed by the questions, and. Uh, and it was a, I think it helped them understand how I think and how I run the White House and how we deal with threats. John. Mr. President, as you know, a lot of critics suggested that you wanted to appear jointly with the vice president so that you two could keep your story straight or something. Yeah. Can you tell us what you think of the value of appearing together and how you would answer those critics? Yeah, first of all, look, I mean, if we had something to hide, we wouldn't have met with them in the first place. We answered all their questions. And uh, as I say, I think I, I came away good about the session. Uh, because I wanted them to know, you know, how I set strategy, how we run the White House, how we deal with threats. Uh, the vice president answered a lot of their questions, answered all their questions. And I think it was important for them to see our body language as well, how we work together. Uh, uh, but it was, uh, you know, the commissioners will speak for themselves over time. They'll, they will let you know whether they thought it was a fruitful series of discussions. I, th I think they did. I think they, I think they, th I think they found it to be useful. Yeah, Adam. Mr. President, did, did the, yes. did the, don't you think that the families deserve to have a transcript or to be able to see what you <laughs> Adam, said? Adam, you asked me that question yesterday. I, I got the today. same answer, yeah. Can you say with any confidence that there are no al-Qaeda operatives active in the country today? Uh, no, I can't say that. I should ask you about that. No, they didn't. 
But I'm not going to get any more details about what they asked me. I told you I wasn't going to get any details about what they asked me, and then I just fell into your trap. But uh, now let me let me let me talk about vulnerabilities, and I got to get back to work. We are still vulnerable to attack, and uh, the reason why is Al Qaeda still exists. Al Qaeda is dangerous. Al Qaeda hates us, and uh, uh, we have to be a correct 100 percent of the time in defending America, and they got to be right once. And therefore, uh, we are vulnerable. But people need to know we're working. We, the government, at all levels, are working uh, long hours to protect America. We're doing the best we can. The best way to secure America, however, is to stay on the offensive and bring those people to justice before they harm America again. And that's what we're continuing to do. But uh, you know, this, so long as there's an Al Qaeda enemy that is willing to kill, uh, we are vulnerable. Thank you all. no longer surrender this country or its people to the false song of globalism. The nation state remains the true foundation for happiness and harmony. I am skeptical of international unions that tie us up and bring America down. And under my administration, we will never enter America into any agreement that reduces our ability to control our own affairs. It didn't take long for German Foreign Minister Frank Walter Steinmeier to react to Donald Trump's America First rhetoric. Steinmeier said, The world's security architecture has changed, and it is no longer based on two pillars alone. It cannot be conducted unilaterally. No American president can get round this change in the international security architecture. Steinmeier a Bilderberg attendee is referring to the New World Order rollout of the United Nations infestation of the United States local police force with its strong cities network, announced by the U.S. Constitution circumventing Attorney General's office to the United Nations in 2015, no less. Furthermore, is it any wonder why the Strong Cities Network recognizes constitutionalists as their number one threat? And just what kind of force is behind Lynch's words? The UN houses the permanent delegations of the Sharia Law Enforcing Organization of Islamic Cooperation. The OIC, as it's known, is overseeing the cancerous expansion of Sharia law with the assistance of the United Nations, the EU, and the federal government of the United States, utilizing waves of immigrants to force European and American cities to submit to the eventual One World Order. The OIC is based in Astana, the capital city of Kazakhstan. Astana is a planned 21st century New World Order city by all accounts, meaning its array of one world government promoting structures were built with the Kazakhstan's petrodollars to act as the headquarters for the emerging New World Order takeover. Kazakhstan is led by Nursultan Nazarbayev, by all accounts a human rights violating dictator that has ruled over Kazakhstan for nearly 26 years. Under Nazarbayev, as CBS reported in 2011, Severe limits on political freedoms and freedom of speech, detainee and prisoner abuse, arbitrary arrest and detention, particularly of government opponents, lack of an independent judiciary, pervasive corruption, discrimination and violence against women, and trafficking in persons are typical of Nazarbayev's rule. A recent New York Times story claims Nazarbayev's regime has been paying Washington, D.C. think tanks to issue glowing reports on the country that largely ignore its glaring shortcomings in political freedom and human rights, and that the Nazarbayev regime has even been alleged to have made illegal payments to as yet undetermined members of Congress seeking to gain their favor. Basically, 
a 21st century occultic hub run by a New World Order dictator with his hands in the pockets of your elected leaders, is the epicenter of the Islamic Sharia movement exploding in Europe and quietly invading the United States. Should Sharia law be over the U.S. Constitution? Yes, and the U.S. Constitution, which is made by people, mm. and the Sharia law is made by Allah. So that is all the way above. That has to be definitely in the land, not for the America, for the whole world would be above. So Sharia that law. should be above the U.S. Definitely. Constitution. Yes. This isn't a drill. The engineered collapse of civilization is well underway. Billions of dollars and decades of planning have been invested in the very international security architecture. Donald Trump and patriotic Americans must actively dismantle. John Bound for Infowars.com. <laughs>
We've got to do it where I can get to my office, and then we can uh, we can do it. How's the quality now? The phone's okay. It's cut down a little bit, but listen, it's we can at least you can load Skype on your phone. And I'm not. I should have done this before the show, but let me just kiss your kiss your ring and say, please do it. If you put Skype on your iPhone or whatever you've got, we could do audio Skype with you with headphones. It'd be so good, George. Okay, we should try that. I promise I will send you. I will send you uh, a key lime pie if you do it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the pot. What would you have in the pot? I don't know. Uh, a, a, a gorgeous, gorgeous female. But uh, let me tell you, Alex, so much is going on in this planet right now. It is absolutely unbelievable. Uh, it, when, let, let's talk a little bit about the election, first of all, and what's happening now. Uh, right now, it looks like, obviously, Donald Trump is going to be the front runner for the Republicans, though I still think it's going to be a brokered convention there. And then we've got Hillary Clinton, the front runner for the Democrats. And there's so much under the table about what uh, she is and who she is that the American public just does not know. Uh, there's not much going on out there at all. The, the Trump possibilities are there because people are frustrated with everything, everything. He may end up being a great nominee, but people just want to change. And uh, I've never seen in my life more confusion, and also more excitement about an election in, in all my life. How about you? Well, I, I, I mean, I agree with you that the system is trying to force feed us. Uh, AP poll shows 6% trust in mainstream media. Where is all this collapse in confidence going, George? It's going out the window because people are fed up with everything that's going on with America. They just don't trust government. Uh, you know, you, you sensed that many, many years ago when you started doing your programs, that you were way ahead of the curve. Um, we started picking up on that. We started um, not downplaying the paranormal, which was a staple of Coast to Coast during uh, our Bell's days, but we realized, as you did, uh, when I started having you on as a guest, that this planet is changing, and it's you just can't do strange ghosts and things like that all the time. You know, it's still a staple of coast to coast, but things are affecting people, their lifestyle, their the way they uh, they live, their families, their income, their jobs, and they're frust they're frustrated. So we started to tweak the evolved coast to coast, much like you have tweeted Infowars and Prison Planet, and it's it's become huge now. I mean, you, you talked about our audience, and thank you for the generosity there, but people are at a breaking point, and it's our job, Alex, it's yours, it's mine, to make sure people stay calm during these very turbulent times. Well, it is our job, George, and I want to, again, cover just a whole bunch of issues, radical Islam with you, where you see the world going, earth changes. But first off, Washington, D.C., I'm going to put on screen behind me footage we've shot uh, in D.C., the richest city probably in the world, and they are so insulated, the elite believe they're in their own world. And here's Dennis Hastert, former Speaker of the House, sentenced to only 15 months for raping all these young people, all these children, uh, it's just over the top, and, and this just keeps popping up, pedophilia in D.C., and, and just all these other forms of corruption, and it turns out that he was recruited by Republican leadership to run for Congress to begin with out of nowhere, which shows to me it's a pedophile guild uh, above him. Look at the Catholic Church and all these other institutions that have been infested uh, by these people the corruption is intensifying. What do you think about the Hastert situation? Oh, absolutely disgusting, despicable. And, you know, it's it's just the tip of the iceberg. We've heard stories we haven't gone with on Coast to Coast because it's difficult to prove. Um, but we've heard stories that some, you know, high officials go off on little junkets and trips and secret islands and covert with, you know, young people and children, and it's deplorable to me. It's truly deplorable. And 
something's got to be done about this. You know, Hassard's sentence is minimal with his compared to his crime. And, uh, you know, like you just say, what has happened in the, you know, I was, I was raised a Catholic, went to, went to uh, catechism classes every week. Um, but I don't go to church like that anymore. I don't go to organized religion because what they did and how they hid this, um, has tainted me, and it's unfortunate because there are some wonderful priests out there who are God-loving, God-fearing, and care about people, but but it's tainted everything. Sure, well, that's and, how you uh, take down institutions, is getting corrupt people in place and then doling the news out that a bunch of pedophiles run the government and run the Catholic Church and run everything else, basically. Then that finally brings it down. I mean, this is really a well-thought-out plan to demoralize our country. Well, and it is demoralizing our country. I mean, you talk to anybody out there, and aside from people who care deeply about their own families, as we all do, most people are just upset. Donald Trump has a 97% chance of winning the Republican nomination even before the convention. And he will likely get enough delegates even if he loses Indiana. Meanwhile, the Trump train rolls on. And we take you now live to a Trump rally in Southern California. And we go now to Rob Dew, Josh Owens, there at the scene. What's going on? That's right. Rob Dew reporting for Infowars.com. We are in Costa Mesa, California, which is south of Long Beach. And we are at the Pacific Amphitheater. Holds about 8,500 people. Right now there's a large line going around this way. Uh, we came up here in a hurry and we just recorded some footage for you guys back at home of uh, a disgruntled anti-Trump protester who was uh, arguing with some people. And uh, I guess he got it handed to him because he, he left. He ended up leaving without much of an incident. But uh, it's definitely a lot of people here. We just arrived on scene. We flew out today about 1.30 from Austin, got here, hit the ground, and are now looking at all the Californian, poor California Trump people. There are supposed to be around 500 protesters, at least off of one Facebook page. They, they said about 500 people were gonna be attending a protest here because they don't like it when people get together to talk about things like uh, you know, national sovereignty, building a wall, um, improving the economy. Some people don't like that. They don't want to hear that. So uh, go ahead, Darren, fire away. Well, I was just going to say a lot of people have, you know, they're, they're already suspecting that since it's Southern California that you're going to see a lot of Bernie supporters. You're going to see a lot of even Hillary Clinton supporters because it is a, a liberal state. However... However, I, I lived in California for many, many years, and there's a lot of good old boys out there as well. I imagine there's a lot of Trump supporters. Uh, what are you seeing so far as far as the ratio between Trump, pro-Trump and anti-Trump agitators? I have yet to see any protesters except one or two that were at the front of the line. Right now you can see behind me they have metal detectors set up where they're slowly filing people through. But, uh, yeah, we just came up here because we saw people surrounding uh, a group and we want to see what was going on and get catch that on uh, on video. But right now, if you look, the line starts here, goes over this way. There's at least, you know, 300 people right around me now. The line stretches down the parking lot. Hey, what do you think about all this right now? It's, it's, yeah? it's really racist. <laughs> but then again, what are we going to do? Let's look at the other people. It's pretty funny. It, it's, it, it's hilarious. Yeah, we were laughing. Yeah. It's, it's great. Are you guys going in to see Trump? Yes. Okay. It's it's going to be the best stand-up act ever. Yeah, you think so? Yeah. It's, it's kind of funny how, like, we're 2016, but how very primitive people are. It's like, it's like the 19th devolved. Exactly, because yeah. you think in the 1960s, Martin Luther the King would have, like, put the end to all this, but we're going backwards, and if, well, if freaking Trump becomes president, it, it's over. Martin <laughs> Luther King over? was a Republican. Uh, maybe to start of something, but... You know, Martin Luther King was a Republican. Yes, I know that. It, it, it is funny to see people acting like this. But these people just are showing up here to come see Trump. There are other people coming here agitating them. What do you think of those people? Um, it's, it goes to primitive on both sides. Yeah. <laughs> because um, there's no really need to be here because they know they're going to instigate something that might turn out to be worse. Right. It's not going to... It, it's... No it's not going to stop them doing what they're going to do today. It's to support Trump. Yeah. So no matter who's doing anything, it's not going to. We're getting a chance to build the wall right now. Obviously, people in Southern California are pissed. 
about what's going on, I guess, with the illegal immigration here. What What is your uh, opinion on illegal immigration? Um, well, the opinion, because I, I'm Native American, so we, our ancestors always been here. Right. So everybody's illegals. And even, like, even from Mexico, people from Europe, people from Africa, people from the Middle East. But that's part of the evolution process, coming up with borders and having countries and nation states. You know, a lot of the Constitution was based off the uh, Iroquois. Yes. I was not aware of that. The Iro- Iroquois Confederacy. Yeah. But I, I, to me, I have nothing against the immigrants because yeah. they're not doing anything to hurt me. And this, people just need to love each other. That's the, that's the thing. All right, man. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for talking with us. Okay, it looks like some people are, their slow agitators are moving in. And uh, looks like these guys probably are. So, Darren, it's a very interesting scene. There's no setup. There's no setup. Uh, I don't see any protests set up over here yet, but they're small contingent of cops. They said about 500 people were going to be here. So, I'm not sure. What's going to happen? I mean, we just got on the ground, ran out, and uh, put on our Skype gear to get to get to this report, so we could uh, send you guys a message back home, see what was going on. Do you have any other questions? Well, I was just I was going to make a comment. I, I bet you there would be a lot less protesters and agitators if Trump would have these rallies at like 11 o'clock in the morning, because most of these guys, <laughs> you know, they don't even though they don't have jobs. They stay yeah. up. That's right. They stay up playing Xbox, getting high until you know two o'clock, three o'clock in the morning. And then, uh, you know, they sleep until noon. So, hey, when's the last time you ever seen, uh, saw a riot before noon, for example? Exactly. And, you know, <laughs> what was interesting, I, I was uh, at a convenience store getting some water, and there was a guy getting a couple beers, and he had a megaphone with him. And I said, I said, where are you going? He goes, oh, there's some guy coming into town. I got to go make myself be heard. So <laughs> I thought that was pretty interesting. I imagine he was talking about Trump. That was just a mile down the road from here. So we'll see. I haven't seen two. Uh, there's no loud contingent of protesters. It looks like there's small little groups mingling in and well, look, uh, you, talking. You, you just people. got there, so I'm sure you're going to get lots of good footage. I want to remind everyone to this evening and tomorrow, be sure to check out the Alex Jones channel on YouTube. And, yeah. you know, it was interesting, that guy that you were talking to earlier, he said it's ridiculous seeing people acting like this. Acting like what? They're going to see a presidential candidate make a speech. What's so ridiculous about that? Exactly. Well, at, some of these people obviously have a problem with it. Hey, are you guys here to protest Trump? Sorry? Are you guys protesting Trump? Yeah, I'm, we're opposing Trump, yes. You're opposing Trump? And why is that? Because I believe that strong communities will make police and politicians obsolete. We need to take our power back as individuals, as communities. We need to stop giving it away to these politicians, to the police that we have guarding us everywhere that are murdering our people all over in every community all across the nation okay this is why strong communities make police and politicians obsolete and what does that start with excuse me that starts with strong families doesn't it exactly yeah strong families strong people we need to unite and create strength amongst ourselves and stop giving our f-ing power away that, that was very interesting. So uh, talking about strong communities, I think one way to have strong communities is for people to have more of their uh, disposable income to themselves and not being taxed to death on social programs that they don't want or don't use. Hmm. And I think that's one way you combat uh, having weak communities. And another thing is having strong families. And, uh, you know, I, I can't say it for the Republican Party, but I think conservatives and libertarians in general are more pro-family than, say, the Democrat Party, who's more interested in uh, giving women the right to terminate their unborn children. Hey, dude, where's this being held at? You said it's in Costa Mesa, but where exactly? Yeah, at the, the amphitheater? The Pacific Amphitheater. Pacific it's Amphitheater. called the Pacific Amphitheater. I imagine you know, there's a view of the Pacific Ocean just beyond this wall, this little fence area over here. And uh, so, yeah, people are lining up. They just now opened the gates. Uh, it starts at 7 p.m. Central, or 7 p.m. Um, Pacific. Pacific. So it'll be 9 p.m. Central. Yeah. And we're going to be here. I, I might get on if, if things get pretty uh, wild. I'll, I'll turn it on Facebook mentions and uh, start broadcasting live. So, Okay. Well, we look forward to checking it out. I'm sure it's going to get quite heated, and you're going to see some good exchanges like you guys uh, always do. So, hey, we just got a triggering event. Uh-oh. Look. Trigger alert. Trigger alert. Trigger alert right here. <laughs> Guy said Hillary for prison. And, uh, for prison! 
So that, that definitely triggered him right there, the, the lady I was just talking about, the strong communities. I don't think Hillary's interested in strong communities. She's interested in people being beholden to the government. Absolutely. And uh, for bigger government, just as Bernie Sanders is. So I don't see how, you know, these people come out here and they want to talk about strong communities and this and that. But you're not going to get that with these uh, Democratic policies. You're just going to get more social programs that lead to more taxes and less uh, human freedom. Well, hopefully some of them will get to go inside the amphitheater and maybe uh, learn a thing or two from Donald Trump himself. Do we're out of time, but uh, again, right. everybody check out the YouTube channel, the Alex Jones channel on YouTube, and we'll look forward to more reports. That's right. Rob Dew signing off from the West Coast of California at Costa Mesa, just outside the Pacific Amphitheater. Thank you, Darren. Y'all right. have fun. All right, folks, that's going to do it for tonight's broadcast. The M4's nightly news will return, Lord willing, Tomorrow night at 7 o'clock p.m. Central Time.